Hello everyone, it has been a couple of weeks since my last weekly space news recap, this being due to my attendance to Space Creator Day in Speyer, which, while it gave me the fantastic opportunity to meet up with a bunch of you and get lots of content talking to KSP2's creative director Nate Simpson and the upcoming KSP2 4 Science Update, it left me with no time to make Space This Week content. But I'm back now. At least physically. Health-wise, you might be able to tell I've come down with a bit of a cold, so sorry if I sound a bit more nasal than usual, but I'll be darned if I let that stop me, because we have a lot of stuff to cover this week, and it's just going to be the past seven days, rather than trying to squish all three weeks I've missed into one video, but that doesn't mean we're short for content. Starbase saw what we hope will be the final Ship 25 Booster 9D stack before launch, ULA prepares the first Flight Centaur 5 stage before shipment, SpaceX launches a Falcon 9 but aborts another, China sends three more astronauts to its space station, two cosmonauts conduct a spacewalk on the ISS, deluge tests for Artemis 2 take place, and much, much more. Let's jump right in. We're all really hoping that we're now approaching the final steps for Orbital Flight Test 2 for Starship. I know I and many others have been saying this for a while, and the launch is certainly a long time coming. Can you believe Boost 9 is actually over a year old now? It celebrated its first birthday last Friday, having been fully stacked in the Mega Bay on the 27th of October 2022. Anyway, we do have some fairly strong reasoning for a launch sometime in November now. I know I said this video would only cover the last seven days, but I might need to stretch that if it helps provide some context, such as right now. Here's a clip of Ship 25 being restacked on Booster 9 on the 20th of October, this being the fourth total full stack for the vehicles, which was followed by some significant testing ahead of Orbital Flight Test 2. Tests began with partial propellant loading of Booster 9 on the 22nd of October, following a detank and then reloading of propellant the same day. As you can see from the frost lines, this loading used more propellant than the last one, and once again used both the methane and oxygen tanks. After detanking again, next in line for testing was Stage 0. We saw a water deluge system test, as well as an engine compartment purge test. That concluded Sunday's testing, but then, on Tuesday, testing resumed. This time we saw propellant loading for the entire Starship Super Heavy full stack. This being particularly special as we've not seen full propellant loading of the full stack since the addition of the hot staging ring below the Starship. Following propellant loading, the FireX fire suppression system was activated, overall indicating that this was essentially a wet dress rehearsal test, i.e. the final test to be conducted before launch. A wet dress rehearsal is essentially doing the launch, but stopping the countdown right before the ignition stage. But wait, why wasn't the water deluge system tested then? Well, it was, but not before the vehicles were both detanked, which is the same situation as the last deluge system test in fact. My theory here is that the extremely cold temperatures of the booster, when loaded with cryogenic liquids, poses the risk that the water could end up creating large amounts of ice on the booster, posing a risk to the vehicle and launch infrastructure. What do you think? Is that the reason? Or something else? Let me know your thoughts down below. Anyway, with SpaceX opting to perform such tests, we're hoping that they're anticipating a launch license very soon. The Fish and Wildlife Services were spotted at the Starbase site, performing inspections following the wet dress rehearsal tests, hopefully not finding anything that would cause them to delay the launch any further. But following all the big full stack activities, things concluded with the detachment of the ship quick disconnect arm on Thursday. Shortly afterwards, workers were seen covering the ship's quick disconnect ports, followed by the arm being swung out and Ship 25 being raised and then lowered down. Given all the points covered thus far in this video, we're keeping our fingers and toes crossed that this marks the final D-stack of Ship 25 from Booster 9. Interestingly, it wasn't just Ship 25 that was removed from the booster, but also the hot staging ring. It's unclear why this was, perhaps to enable inspection of the structure following full stack propellant loading, or to provide access to the top of Booster 9, or some other reason. Go nuts in the comments below what you think the main reason was, but whatever the reason was, the ring was later reinstalled towards the end of the week. With so much excitement on the orbital launch mount, it's easy to overlook the sub-orbital launch mount, which saw its own fair share of action. Suborbital Test Stand B has been home to Ship 26 for a number of weeks now, and on the 20th of October, we saw partial propellant loading of the vehicle, shortly followed by a single Raptor engine static fire. 
The next day, the SpaceX LR11000 crane hooked itself up to the vehicle before lifting it off the test stand and onto a self-propelled transporter. The vehicle was then moved, briefly stopping at the gates to the launch site before later being rolled back to the rocket garden. At this point in time, we're not sure what the fate of Ship 26 will be. Personally, I'm skeptical if we'll ever see a flight from this now. The leading theory was that it was a rapidly built upper stage prototype just to allow SpaceX to begin launches quickly and start testing the Super Heavy, but with all the delays, we now have multiple complete Starships that are almost flight ready themselves, so there might not really be any benefit to using Ship 26 at this stage, but all remains to be seen. Mega Bay 2's construction has been a bit of a hallmark on these Starship updates for the past few months, but it looks like things are nearing completion now. It has now been topped off with the placement of its final roof beam celebrated with the raising of a flag on top of the structure. Nearby we spotted some new CO2 tanks. These will eventually be installed inside the chines of an upcoming Super Heavy booster. The CO2 gas is used for purging the booster engine bay. SpaceX conducted one of the four orbital launches that took place over the last seven days, this mission being another Starlink launch. There was another Starlink launch set to take place earlier today, but sadly this was aborted during terminal countdown. Reattempt should be fairly soon though, only a couple of hours after this video goes live hopefully, so hopefully the second time is the charm. Despite the lack of launch, it was really cool to get a good look at the fully illuminated crew access tower next to the rocket at Space Launch Complex 40 at Kennedy. The week's successful SpaceX launch was Starlink Group 7-6, which launched yesterday from the Vandenberg Space Launch Complex. The Falcon carried 22 Starlink V2 minis to low Earth orbit, and the rocket's first stage managed a successful touchdown on the drone ship Of Course I Still Love You, stationed in the Pacific Ocean, having previously supported six missions. Vulcan Centaur is getting very close to its maiden flight now. United Launch Alliance CEO Tori Bruno shared a picture of the first flight-ready Centaur 5, the upper stage of the rocket, emerging from the high-pressure test cell, ready for its final touches before shipment to Kennedy. One Twitter user asked what's left on the tick list for Vulcan, to which Tori replied, finish up and ship the Centaur 5, integrate it with the first stage booster, conduct another wet dress rehearsal, integrate the payload, and finally count down and launch the world's biggest and fastest Christmas gift. This last point being a nod to the target launch date of Christmas Eve. Here's hoping we still see this thing launch before the year is up. China was a hive of space excitement last week. To start small, on Monday we saw a Long March 2D carry three Yaogan 39 reconnaissance satellites from the Zichang Satellite Launch Center to low Earth orbit. Shortly after, official sources communicated that the three remote sensing satellites were fully operational. In what I think was probably the more significant of the Chinese launches last week, on Thursday, a beefy Long March 2F blasted off from the Qiquan Launch Center, carrying the Shenzhou 17 crew to the Tiangong Space Station, the sixth crewed mission to the station that China has flown so far. Hongbo Tang, Shenji Tang, and Xinling Zhang will spend the next 180 days living and working aboard the station. The Shenzhou spacecraft autonomously docked to the forward port of the Tianyi Core module after a short cruise, and the station's current inhabitants welcomed their successors on board, bringing the total crew of the station to six, and the total number of people living in Earth orbit right now to 13. Fun fact, the Shenzhou 17 spacecraft has actually been maintained in a state of flight readiness since April, so that it could be launched as a lifeboat for the Shenzhou 16 crew in case they needed to evacuate the station and the Shenzhou 16 spacecraft was compromised. The only other orbital launch we saw last week was a Russian Soyuz 2.1B, which lifted off on Saturday from the Plasetska launch site, carrying the Lotus S1 Signals Intelligence satellite to the low Earth orbit. The satellite is a classified spacecraft operated by the Russian Air and Space Forces, so not a lot is known about it other than it'll be used for signals intelligence. One launch vehicle that we didn't see last week was Rocket Lab's Electron. This rocket has been grounded following its launch failure back in September, but I'm pleased to say that Rocket Lab recently announced that they have received FAA authorization to resume Electron launches again. Hopefully Rocket Lab have nailed the fix for the launch failure's cause, and Electron can continue launching with regularity. SpaceX wasn't the only agency performing water deluge tests last week. On Tuesday, NASA's Exploration Ground Systems team conducted a water flow test with the mobile launcher at Kennedy Space Center's Launch Complex 39B. This was the third in a series of tests to verify the overpressure protection and sound suppression systems in preparation for the Artemis II launch. During liftoff, 
400,000 gallons, or 1.8 million litres, of water will rush onto the pad to help protect the SLS rocket, Orion spacecraft, mobile launcher, and launch pad from any overpressurization and extreme sound produced during ignition and liftoff. International Space Station updates now. Last week on Wednesday, two cosmonauts from Expedition 70, Oleg Kononenko and Nikolai Chubb, ventured outside the space station to install a radar communication system on the station's exterior. During their spacewalk, they also conducted inspections on a backup radiator attached to the Nyorka module, which had previously experienced a leak. Towards the end of their mission, they deployed a nano-satellite aimed at advancing solar sail technology and aiding researchers in their investigations, though unfortunately the sail failed to deploy. In the very near future, NASA astronauts Jasmine Mogbilly and Laurel O'Hara will collaborate for an all-female spacewalk. Their primary objective is to replace a trundle-bearing assembly that ensures the proper rotation of the station's solar arrays as they track the sun. Additionally, they will dismantle an electronics box from a communication antenna on the station as part of their responsibilities. Looking forward, significant progress is being made in NASA's Boeing Crew flight test mission. This mission marks, finally, the much-anticipated inaugural crewed flight of Boeing's Starliner vehicle to the space station. NASA astronauts Butch Wilmore and Sonny Williams are in the process of preparing for this mission, which is expected to be, at long last, ready for flight in March next year. The mission is set to last around eight days and is aimed at certifying the vehicle for regular astronaut transport to and from the station. Will they do it or will Starliner face yet more delays? Hash it out in the comment section below. I've posted a lot of Kerbal Space Program 2 updates recently, from a deep dive into the science updates, trailers and footage, as well as an interview with Nate Simpson himself. But one thing I didn't really mention was another big bit of news, and that's how the team planned to fix wobbly rockets. I posted a YouTube short earlier today addressing this, but in short, get it, is a pun? <laughs> Here's a side by side. Left is the current game version, right is the for science version. The wobbliness is being solved by the game adding invisible supplementary joints in a similar fashion to KSP-1's auto-strut feature. This is not just for single stacks though, but aircraft wings and radially attached boosters are also much less wobbly and nightmarish. But that wraps up today's installment of Space This Week. I hope you enjoyed my grand return, though I'm afraid it might be somewhat short-lived, as in November, myself and Beardy Penguin are teaming up to do a 24-hour KSB Esports Endurance event in France, which means I'll be out of the country again, so there won't be a space this week on the 20th of November, so sorry about that. But I'll endeavour to post a video every other Monday aside from that one. I hope you enjoyed today's return to flight. Big thanks to my Patreon supporters and channel members, names on the screen over to the left there, and thank you for watching. I'll catch you in the next one. I hope you enjoyed today's video.